Uh, this is the last set of videos I'm going to do where I read. Interesting experiment, but I don't like it very much. Uh, I'm not sure anybody is going to want to watch these anyway, but I committed myself to doing them, so I'm doing them. Uh, this last one is going to be about 11 videos long. Sorry about that. You can read the whole essay on my website. The title of it is Barack Obama and the Reality of the Antichrist Spirit. With a kind of subtitle, What Might Happen If You Begin to Insert Reason into Christian Discourse on Questions of Public Life. <coughs> The purpose of the following material is to help Christians and others appreciate that there are alternative views which might help our public life, our life of shared social and political discourse and action. Alternative to those ideas that tend to dominate what is thought to be a Christian view of how to participate as a member or a citizen of any social order, such as a state. In order to lay out this alternative, however, it is also necessary to deepen the reader's understanding of the potentials of true Christian practice. What actually happens when we take up the cross and follow Christ, instead of just uncritically accepting certain ill-thought-out systems of belief? With that preface, let me begin. Among some right-wing and fundamentalist individuals claiming to speak as Christians, one can find the idea that the current president of the USA, Barack Obama, is the Antichrist. Their interpretation of the meaning of this biblical idea is in error. Although by seeking the, the true meaning of this idea, that we might come to know through the letters of John in the New Testament, John 1 and John 2 particularly, this may help us understand better political life through searching for the deeper understanding of another verse, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. This is to say that if we deepen our appreciation of this idea of an antichrist spirit, we can at the same time deepen our understanding of our shared public life, which we call politics. This will not be easy, for we have many confusions here, here so we need to proceed carefully and look at the situation from multiple and flexible directions. Here's what the Bible actually says about the Antichrist spirit, for it appears only in one place, the first two letters of John. John 1, 2, 18, 19. Children, it is the last hour, and just as you heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have arisen. From this we know that it is the last hour, they went out from us, but they are not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have removed with, remained with us. But they went out in order that it might be shown that they are all not of us. 1 John 2, 22, 23. <coughs> who is the liar? But the one who denies that Christ is the, Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son as the Father also. John 1, 4, 2, 3. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And this is the Spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that it is coming, and now it is already in the world. 2 John 1 7. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, and those who did not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh, this is the deceiver and the Antichrist. Biblical speculation by error capable human beings has created an idea that conflates these passages in the first two letters of John with images from Revelations as well as certain ideas in the Old Testament. It is amazing the number of supposed thinkers who don't bother to find out that Revelations in the Old Testament never mentions the Antichrist spirit in their wide-ranging representations of prophecies of coming dark or evil spiritual influences. It is then through the lame and undisciplined thinking that the Antichrist spirit, a 
kind of attitude of the human soul living in most human beings is morphed into the picture of a single person or an evil being. This extreme exaggeration then disables us from actually appreciating what might be inhabited, what might be learned from this idea in the letters of John, were we less inclined to find the world inhabited by fearful and evil boogeymen. As with much today that masquerades as Christian practice, this hysteria itself is of the Antichrist spirit. For it denies the Son, not intellectually, but by deed, by refusing to recognize, understand, and practice the teachings and follow the deeds of the Son, and substitute instead of true practice a vain allegiance to ill-reasoned systems of belief. In this article, I have chosen to write of the Antichrist spirit, small s, and not of the Antichrist spirit, capital S, <coughs> hoping to make the following distinction. In the latter case, with the use of the term spirit capitalized, a being is implied, as if these words, Antichrist spirit, were the name of someone, perhaps invisible, perhaps visible. In using the term Antichrist spirit, not capitalized, instead, my intention is to use the small s spirit to refer to an attitude of soul. So throughout this article, the term Antichrist spirit is to represent a general attitude of the human soul and not an evil being. This is fully consistent, in my view, with the basic idea in the letters of John. Another principal example of this Antichrist spirit in contemporary Christian thought is the idea that something, in order to be spiritually true, must be biblical. That is, for example, the idea that it can't be true that human beings are immortal spirits, experiencing a sequence of incarnation over long periods of time, the idea of reincarnation and karma. As this idea of the cultural East came to the fore in America and elsewhere in recent decades, Christian religious thinking denied it, and based on its based its denial in the absence of this idea in the Bible. This ideal is not absent from the Bible, by the way, but those who oppose it force various possible biblical interpretations toward their own doctrines. That is, they make Bible passages fit the meaning they have already decided they ought to mean. As regards the idea of reincarnation and karma, we need only realize the profound meaning hidden openly in Christ's comment that we are forgiven seventy times seven. Such a level of complete forgiveness by the divine mystery is most clearly manifested in those circumstances when we are allowed to return to the body again and again in order to have as many chances as possible to resolve our errors. To believe we can learn the lessons of Christ in just one lifetime is to imagine that Christ has little patience for his children and for whom he has demonstrated so much love. The Divine Father mystery would not deny us all the time we need in order to learn what life has to teach. God is the God of all, not just those living in Western culture. And bringing the idea of reincarnation and karma from out of Eastern culture to Western culture, is God not speaking? Here is an additional idea by which to more deeply understand the creation. Yet, we deny God the capacity to speak to us from another quarter, by our limiting all that we can know and think to only what is taught in the Bible. <clears throat>